the 16th of June in the year 2009, and we are in the New Hamlet during our 21-day retreat. In the Gospel, there is the story of uh, a farmer who discovered a treasure in a piece of land. And he went home and gave up all other kind, all other pieces of land and everything. Just kept that uh, small piece of land with the treasure. And that treasure is uh, the kingdom of God. We know that uh, the kingdom of God should be looked for in the present moment. Because the, only the present moment uh, is. The past is no longer there. And the future is not yet there. So the place where you should look for the kingdom of God are the pure land of the Buddha, the place where you you should look for your happiness, your peace, your fulfillment should be in the present moment. It's so simple, so clear. But if we have the tendency to slide back to the past or to run into the future, we have to recognize that kind of tendency, that habit energy, and try to uh, learn to be free from it. In order to really uh, establish ourselves in the present moment. The Buddha told a group of uh, businessmen led by Anathapindika that it is possible, gentlemen, to live happily right in the present moment. The Buddha saw in their mind that businessmen are very concerned about their success in the future, and most of them are not capable of enjoying the present moment. They don't have the time for themselves, for their family. They don't have the time to love, to make the happiness of people around. They are sucked into the future. So the Buddha told them directly that uh, they can live happily right there in the present moment. And the expression uh, Ditta Dhamma Sukha Vihara, living happily in the present moment, was used by the Buddha five times in that discourse. And that discourse uh, exists in the Pali Canon. It exists in the Chinese Canon. And uh, it's not very well known in uh, Buddhist temples, Buddhist circles. Uh, here in Plum Village, we also practice pure land. But our pure land is in the present moment. The pure land is now or never. The same thing is true with uh, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is now or never. And that is not just an idea, the kingdom of God. It is a reality. If you know how to use your mindful breathing, mindful walking, you go home to the present moment, and you touch the many wonders of life in you and around you, and all that belongs to the kingdom of God. This uh, lotus leaf, to where it should belong, If it does not belong to the kingdom of God, where should it belong to? 
and you, my friends, each of you, you belong to the kingdom of God. You belong to the pure land of the Buddha. You are a marvel, like uh, this uh, lotus flower. And so those of us who know how to really come home to the present moment, we can touch the wonders of life that are there. That's yours to enjoy. That is yours to explore. The kingdom of God is not an idea because uh, the lotus flower is part of it. And you are a part of it. Why do you have to look for it elsewhere and in the future? And in the beginning of the retreat, we spoke of, about the bakery, the cake shop. A child ventured into it and feel free to eat any, any kind of uh, delicacies that she finds, and she may be embarrassed. Those of us who know how to free ourselves and to come back to the present moment find ourselves in the same kind kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, situation. Everything is wonderful. <coughs> and you can enjoy the kingdom of God in the here and the now. And if you have found the kingdom of God, you don't need to run anymore after fame and money and profit and sex. So in a, a, a Protestant um, uh, assembly in Germany, Geschenktag, uh, I told uh, an audience of 5,000 people that the church should provide us with the teaching and the practice so that we can get in touch with the kingdom of God. And after having got in touch with the kingdom of God, we will stop running after wealth, fame, power, sex. We will not suffer anymore because we have the kingdom of God. So the farmer in the Bible story, biblical story, he gave up everything, but he only kept the, the treasure. So the church has to teach us, has to provide us with the, that kind of teaching. And churchmen has to show us the way. Churchmen has to know how to get in touch with the kingdom of God. Churchmen has to be happy if they want to teach us. At the same time, things should be true in Buddhism. The monks, the nuns should be happy should be living in the pure land of the Buddha in order to help us do the same. When we go home to the present moment, we see that there are so many conditions of happiness already and we don't need another one. You already have enough conditions of happiness. One of you suggested in a note that they should write down in calligraphy, the three words, you have enough. <laughs> that is not only for businessmen, <laughs> but for all of us. We don't need more conditions to be happy. Happiness is possible in the here and the now. So I have written down about four or five. Santusta, that is the Sanskrit. And then Tituk in Chinese. And then English, you have enough. 
It means you already have enough. Don't run anymore. Be happy. I also uh, wrote one in a small circle. You have enough. And uh, without this, Shadi uh, is in English. And if you want me to write it in French, it's okay. In German, okay. <laughs> the teaching about living happily in the present moment is a very pleasant kind of teaching. You can be happy right here and right now. And the practice is also very pleasant. When we climb the hill together this morning, we don't, make, we don't have to make any effort. We enjoy every step. You don't seek for anything. But why walking in like that if you are free of the past, of the future? We can touch the kingdom of God, the pure land of the Buddha, with every step. So you walk in such a way that the kingdom of God is available to you in every step. That is the secret. And there are those of us who can do that. With every step, we touch the kingdom with a certain amount of mindfulness and concentration, you make the kingdom available at every moment. The teaching is very simple. And the practice is not so difficult. <laughs> Maybe you need the encouragement of uh, a Sangha. When you do it together with the Sangha, it's so easy, it's so natural. For those of us who have been abused as a child, this teaching is very important. We should uh, learn how to go back to the old ways to the present moment and realize that the situation now is safe. The suffering of the past is already gone. Why do we have to go home and review it? And, uh, and experience it again and again and again. And maybe we need a Sangha in order to help us not to slide back into the past. You need a friend, you need a Dharma brother, you need a Dharma teacher, you, dharma, uh, you need a Dharma uh, sister in order to help you not to fall back into the past. It's very important. Those of us who have uh, been a victim of abuse, it's very important to leave the past and to go to the present moment and uh, learn how to live with the kingdom of God. You have grown up. You are now capable of defending yourself. Things are safe now. And you, maybe you need a Sangha to support you for some time before you can do that alone. For those of us who have been, uh, who, who, was a vic- who have been a victim of uh, sexual abuse, there is the other teaching that we have learned that uh, the mud and the lotus, they inter- are. It is possible to transform the mud into the lotus. And if you don't know uh, how to preserve the lotus, the lotus will become the mud. The lotus will be rotten and become the mud. And mud and lotus, they, because they into R, we should not be discriminative against one of them. We have to accept both. The 
Sutra teaches us that the idea of uh, production, destruction, increasing, decreasing, root evil, defilement, evacuation, they are just notions in our mind. Even the notion, even good and evil are notions in our mind. The evil is there because uh, the good is there. The good is there because the evil is there. It's like the left and the right. Wherever there is the right, the left is. Wherever there is uh, compassion, violence is. Because there is violence, that is why there is a possibility to have compassion. War and peace, good and evil. So the Heart Sutra is uh, the ultimate uh, teaching, ultimate practice. That all notions that we have of the world, of uh, reality, are creation of our mind. And uh, only that kind of teaching and practice can help us to to transcend the idea of uh, defilement. Because we were abused sexually, we have the feeling that we are defiled. We are not clean. We are not uh, immaculate. But things, everything is impermanent. Everything changes. The mud can be transformed into the lotus. And if you are not careful, the lotus can be can turn into the mud. And mud and lotus inter are. The lotus is very fragrant and pure, but we know that the mud is in there. The mud has been transformed. So the suffering, the defilement that we experience, it can be transformed. And then the teaching of no defilement, no immaculation is the only exit that you have in order to overcome that feeling of being defiled. Only with uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara that you can transcend the, uh, the feeling that you are defiled because you know that ultimately defilement and immaculation are notions of your mind. And not uh, the absolute reality. And this is a wonderful teaching. If you are caught in the notion of absolute defilement, absolute uh, immaculation, you are caught forever and you cannot get out. But if you know that you understand the teaching of interbeing between defilement and immaculation, and then you can get out. And that is very clear in the Buddhist tradition. And there is a third practice that can help you who have been victim of sexual abuse. That is the practice of great vow, great aspiration, the practice of Samantha Madra. You have suffered, and you don't want other people to suffer particularly the young people, the children. So you want to transform yourself into a, a bodhisattva, an activist, an agent of peace and transformation. You are inspired by the desire the aspiration to help protect people, to protect the young people, protect families, protect children, so that they will not uh, become victims of sexual abuse. 
because there are things you can do in order to help. And as a Bodhisattva, you can do so much in order to help uh, protect children, young people, couples from sexual abuse, sexual misconduct. And that, when that energy of aspiration is strong in you, you begin to heal right away. So I want to uh, say it again. The first practice that helps is uh, living happily in a present moment. The second practice is uh, contemplation on the inter- nature of interbeing between defilement and immaculation. It will be lead, very liberating. The third practice is to make a great vow in order to help uh, the children and other people not become victims. And when you have that uh, energy of great vow, you begin to heal very quickly. And then the, there is the, the fourth practice that is uh, universal. And that is the practice of mindful consumption. Mindful consumption is uh, the object of the fifth mindfulness training. You don't consume the things that bring toxins into your body and your mind. They can bring poisons into your body and your mind. And the three biggest poisons is uh, craving, violence, and ignorance, wrong perceptions. When you read an article, when you watch a film, you consume. When you listen to a conversation, you consume. The conversation can be highly toxic, full of anger, full of despair. And if you listen like that in one hour, you get a lot of toxins. You'll be paralyzed because of the toxins you get while you listen to him or to her. So much anger, so much uh, violence. So conversation is an item of uh, consumption. When you read a magazine, when you watch a film, you consume also. Because the film or the article may contain also violence, craving, despair. And it uh, touched the worst thing in you. And if uh, people uh, abuse uh, children sexually because the seed of craving in them is watered by what they see in the film, they, they read in the books. So mindful consumption is a way out. We should not produce that kind of items, even if that bring us a lot of money. And there are those who don't care, don't care. They just want to have more money. They produce anything that can sell. They are destroying us. They are destroying our children. So mindful consumption, mindful production is very important. And if you are a congressman, a senator, a legislator, you should think about discussing about making the kind of law that prohibit the production of such items. In the name of freedom, they produce and they destroy us and our children. In the name of protection, we have to make the law to forbid them. Make the law to forbid them to continue to do so. So for the second mindfulness training about uh, stealing, about uh, wanting 
to get more and more. The teaching of uh, living happily in the present moment is needed. For the fifth mindfulness training, living happily in the present moment should be at the foundation of these uh, mindfulness trainings practice. The teaching of the Buddha is uh, simple enough. <coughs> and many of us have made it into very complicated teaching. So it's our duty to, to bring back that kind of clarity, simplicity to the Buddha's teaching. <coughs> to learn the Dharma and to apply the Dharma into our life, we think that is something good. But it's not always good. Because it depends on our way of doing that. We need a lot of skillfulness, openness, in order to learn and apply the teaching. If you are dogmatic, if you are not narrow-minded, if you are not skillful, you will misunderstand the teaching. And you apply wrongly the teaching, and you will suffer. And right in the time of the Buddha, there were monks and lay people who misunderstood the Buddha. And who uh, practiced wrongly the teaching of the Buddha. So the fact is that you have to be skillful, to be open-minded. in order to receive the teaching. And if you are a Dharma teacher, you should do the same. You have to be very skillful in order to present the Dharma in such a way that people can really understand. Otherwise, they will be caught by what you say. In the Sutra, on the better way to catch a snake, The Buddha addressed a monk called Arita. He, the Buddha, before that, thought about the possibility of living happily in the present moment. And yet, he misunderstood that. He said that, well, well you are free to enjoy the object of your uh, senses. You can enjoy. So you allow yourself to run after the craving. You can enjoy everything. And that is the opposite of what the Buddha wants to say. And the Buddha brought out, uh, uh, offer an example. Someone who, who knows how to catch a snake, he would know how to is, uh, use a stick with a fork in order to pin the snake down. And you go take the snake by the neck. And, and that is very safe. He can catch 100 snakes, 1,000 snakes without being harmed. But if you are not skillful, you catch the snake by the tail, the snake will turn around and bite you. So my teaching is like that. If you are not careful, you, are, you will misunderstand, misunderstand my teaching. And if you apply that into your life, you may suffer. So that is a very wonderful uh, sutra. The teacher has to be skillful. And the student of the Dharma has to be skillful. Otherwise, you will be bitten by the snake. The Buddha <coughs> say, you being is there. Is there. 
that is the first noble truth. But as soon as he opened his mouth and said, ill being, it means ill being is there. You have to accept that is true. We want to demonstrate that we understand him. And what he say is absolutely true. So we try to demonstrate that everything is ill being. The unpleasant thing is ill being, but the pleasant thing is ill being also. And you are very devout. You love the Buddha a lot. You want to help demonstrate what he say is right. But you are distorting his, uh, his teaching. It's like uh, when you point out at the lotus pond, and you say, the mud is there. And someone who wants to support you, yes, there is only mud in the, lo- in, in the pond. That is not true, because there is also a lotus. And that is exactly what the Buddha want to say in the third, uh, in the third uh, noble truth. The third noble truth is well-being. Is there. <laughs> because the cessation of ill being is the presence of well being. It's mathematics, it's exact science. The cessation of ill being means the presence of well being. The Buddha said, the absence of darkness is the presence of light. And this sentence Vô Minh Diệt mentioned is repeated several times in the Sutra. Avidya when avidya, when ignorance is removed, and then vidya, light, understanding will arise. There's something that is coming to an end. And at the same time, there's something that comes into being. The, the absence of darkness means the presence of light, right? So the absence of ill-being means the presence of well-being. The Buddha thought that ill-being is there, but he does not mean that there are only ill-being. Because it's it's clear that in the third third noble truth, he confirmed the existence, the possibility of well-being. Otherwise, he should not have said that it is possible to live happily in the present moment. And then, if uh, there is a path leading to well-being, beginning with right view, insight, the Buddha might have begun with mindfulness. Because mindfulness leads to concentration. Smriti leading to samadhi. And samadhi leading to insight, right view. So the Buddha, instead of being with the right view, he can 
He could have begun with right mindfulness. Whereas mindfulness, it is the starting point. With mindfulness and concentration, you can, can read a right view of the wisdom. And when you have the right view, your thinking is correct. And then your speech <coughs> is right speech. And your action will be right action. And so on. I guess that uh, we can begin with any of the eight uh, right practice. But the Buddha has chosen right view, because the right view is in the absence of uh, wrong views. The wrong view, wrong view is the foundation of all wrong doing that bring about uh, ill being. So the path proposed by the Buddha, the path of the Buddha, is characterized by wisdom, right view, knowledge. And that is not a gift from a god. That is a product of the human being. Enlightenment is a product of a human being. Buddha is a human being. Buddha is not a god. Buddha has produced enlightenment. And he said that any one of us has the seat of enlightenment. And that is the first thing he is, the first remark he made after enlightenment. He said, everyone has that. And why they allow themselves to to, to be carried away life after life in suffering. Everyone has that, the seat of enlightenment. And that is Buddha nature. Buddha nature is not an abstract thing. That the seat of enlightenment, the seat of understanding that is uh, imminent in every one of us. And if we have the time, we come back to ourselves and we touch the seat and we help it grow. And so if uh, if the Buddha has seen the path because he has touched the wisdom within us, uh, within himself. And here in our retreat, we are, not, we are not seeking the path from anyone else. We practice sitting, walking, listening in order to touch the seat of wisdom in us. And if we are able to offer a path for global ethics, let's come from us, not from my God. And that is why the path is a noble path. The noble path is based on the ground of right understanding, right view. And the path of ethics that we propose is a path that is based on right understanding, the insight on interbeing, the insight of no self. By the way, some of us uh, asked the question about the equality complex. <laughs> We understand that uh, the superiority complex is not good. The inferiority complex is not good. But why the, why the equality complex? In psychotherapy, we used to say that uh, low self-esteem is the cause of many kind of uh, psychological problems. 
So we have to go fight low self-esteem. But uh, high self-esteem, maybe sickness too. <laughs> because there are those of us who are so proud of themselves, who think that they are superior to everyone else. to the point that they want to eliminate those, uh, those who are inferior to them. Nazi uh, spirit. They consider other race of people uh, as inferior. They want to purify, so they kill. So that is the complex of superiority. That is also sickness. So to think that you are inferior is, sick, is sickness. But to think of you as being superior is also a sickness. And how about to think of yourself as the equal to the other person? I am not, I am as good as he is. What is wrong with that? The fact is that when you practice uh, looking deeply, we see that there is no self. I am in you, and you are in me. There is no self. The son is in the father, and the father is the son, is in the son. In the teaching of the Trinity, we can see that God the Father can be found in the son. God the son can be found in the Father and the Holy Spirit. So the teaching of interbeing is there. And the same thing is true with the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And it's true with everything else. The British uh, physicist uh, David Bohm spoke about, uh, about uh, two kinds of order. the explicate order and the implicate order. The lotus is outside of the mud. The mud is outside of the lotus. But looking deeply, we see it differently. You know that without the mud, no lotus can be grown. So looking at the mud, you are hopeful that some lotus can be produced. And looking in the flower of lotus, you see the mud. The father and the son. The father is not really outside with the son, and the son is not outside of the father. It is possible, possible to see the father inside of the son, and the son inside of the father. The plant of corn, although you don't see the grain of corn, but the grain of corn is in the plant of corn. So looking, you may have the first impression that things exist outside of each other. <coughs> but when you look more deeply, you see that things are inside of each other. And that is what uh, David Bohm described as uh, the implicate order. So we begin to see and we realize an order called explicate. And if we look more deeply as a practitioner of meditation or as a scientist, we recognize that things are inside of each other. <coughs> 